If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Today on Horse Chats, we've got Annika Overton back again, and um, she's going to talk to us about, well, little big, big shoes, but she's going to talk to us about strategies to develop the relationship between parents and young riders, which I think is important. I think that sometimes parents get put into a role, and whether they're a horse person that's trying to teach their child or just someone who's trying to help and getting a little bit involved and emotional about the whole thing, you know, trying to pick up on it. And I think she's got some really good strategies here that we'll go through. But just before that, I'd like to talk to you about the people who'd like to work in the horse industry. If you would like to work in the horse industry and you're not sure where to start, then have a chat to our friendly team at internationalhorsecollege.com. With the wide variety of horse courses from the complete beginner through to the qualified professional and students in over 20 countries, we'll be able to consider your individual requirements and guide you in the right direction. Simply go to internationalhorsecollege.com to start the conversation. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Now today, Annika, are you there? I certainly am. Hello. I love your title, Little Feet, Big Shoes because that so describes, you know, I'm sort of imagining <laughs> little kids on little ponies. It's so cute, but you're right. The strategies to develop the relationship between the parents and young riders, because it should develop into a stronger relationship. It shouldn't develop into a bit of a battle, which we see sometimes. So the first point you've made, and I'm sort of going through these points. The first point you've made, you've got that the parents should know their children's dreams, goals and desires and discuss them often. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely, absolutely. What I do find, um, little people, they don't often know how to be able to articulate or speak openly about what their goals are. Sometimes they have what they call goal shame. So they might think that what they want is, is their goal is too big or their goal is too small and boring perhaps. And often they have goals are what their peer group wants. So if they're five other riders in their club or their stables or whatnot, they tend to sort of think that that is the goal that I should be riding towards. Whereas what we can do as parents is have those discussions about, well, where are you at now and where would you like to be in three months' time and really give the children the opportunity to try on different types of goals and see how they feel about it and um, be okay that it may not be the same goal that everybody else is looking for because they really do need to have an emotional connection and quite passionate with what it is that they're wanting to work towards because that's what's going to drive them to continue making that effort because they genuinely feel as though that's something that brings up excitement and joy in them. Yeah, yeah. And this is, you know, knowing from an adult point of view, it's very good to have the goals, dreams and desires, but it's more about the effort than the results. So how can you reward the effort over the results, what would the parents be able to do there? Not say you didn't get the goal, but but you've tried and you've given it your best shot. I mean, what happens there? What's the best way? Yeah. Look, that's the whole concept of rewarding effort over results is absolutely huge. One of the main reasons is that as riders or as young people, we can control the amount of effort that we put in. We can have ownership around that. Results are determined by so many different factors. And by not having that control all the time, they tend to feel as though they're, they can get overly emotional about it and they're not able to feel as though they're moving forward. So the idea, and the other thing tends to be is if the, the results are rewarded through either you know being better than somebody else or placing, if they don't actually feel as though they're going to be able to achieve that, they tend to self-sabotage, so they tend to find reasons why they um, can't make that work, why they don't want to put the effort in, and they, or they tend to quit altogether. So when we're sort of thinking about setting goals, the idea is building little Lego blocks, thinking what would you like to be in three months' time or six months' time, and how can we break that down into what would it look like per week and then what it might even look like per day, and we'll talk about in a minute daily habits. Uh, but when they can see their own little chunks and that they're working towards their own little chunks and they're rewarded, it really does help when things don't go well because we all know when we're 
learning something new or something different, more often than not, it goes pear-shaped before it goes better. And riding is a continual things going well and things absolutely not. And so we need to help these little guys know when things aren't going well, the horse, you know, the, your horse might be going through a stage of stopping or they might, you might be lacking a little bit of confidence or, or whatever, a new horse, that if you're awarding the effort, it gives them that opportunity just to keep chugging away day in, day out, making small incremental improvements and they still feel as though that they're getting somewhere and so they'll continue on that road. Okay, well, that certainly makes sense. And I know that um, I think it's Frank Covey said something about, you know, seek to understand, then be understood. It's the same with parents though, isn't it? You know, listen more than you speak, seek to understand. So you're listening. You're not telling the, the child what you want. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, we tend to want to, when having children um, talk to us about their goals and desires, is we tend to want to make them into something and want to fill the space. We want to um, try and improve on and build on what they're, what they're thinking, whereas curiosity, and like you said, seek to understand, is absolutely huge. And often I'll hear parents say, and I know I feel it sometimes too, oh, my children don't listen to me or they won't do, do what I'm asking. But then when I sort of think, well, how well am I listening to them and how well am I taking and and it's really between the lines and it's also noticing when they're talking to you how are they going emotionally? How are they feeling? Can, what can you notice in the colour of their face? What can you notice in their stance and their tone and their voice and their body language? And that often gives you more information to be able to say, well, are they congruent with what they're saying? Are they really believing what they're saying? Or, in fact, are they feeling like this is something that they need to say to keep the parents keep me or keep somebody else happy, but they actually don't feel that way? So listening... It is you know, two eyes and two ears and one mouth. But the eyes and really being curious and paying deep attention to what they're saying matters more. And, and being able to fill the space and let them take that breath and, and think about what is it that they're actually trying to say and what is it. And being okay with saying something that you might not necessarily agree with, but you're just going to let them say it anyway um, without trying to change it immediately. Just understand it. Yeah, the love between a parent and a child, it's not really determined by their results. No, absolutely not, because it is continually moving and changing and shifting and evolving, and we really need them to know that the important things is that they just keep um, keep going, because it never is a continual slope straight up, and they can't be thinking of how they are in relation to other people, because we're all on a different journey. We're always um, in different places at different times, so we can't possibly be trying to expect us to be with somebody else. And often we don't know their story, and I find this when I, I talk to a lot of kids, and well, people don't understand that it's taken me six months just to get this horse to, to jump a clean round or to be able to jump over a coffin or to be able to uh, can around a show jumping and for me to feel calm and relaxed. And for them huge but they may not necessarily win the class and so we want them to feel as though they have made huge progress because they've been able to complete that round and feel really good about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now you've got a point here that says be what you want from your child. Just explain that a little bit more, you know, go into (laughs) a bit more depth there. Yeah, absolutely. And we always talk about, um, you know, we need to walk the walk and we need to demonstrate. But what is the behaviour that we're wanting to change in our child? Are they getting overly emotional or are they getting angry in the warm-up? Or, or what is it that we're wanting to, to try and change? And the first thing we need to do is actually check in with ourselves first and say, well, how are we, in fact, going with that? Because more often than not, if we can shape our behaviour, then that allows the children to do the same. So... Uh, I'll, I'll give an example. This isn't quite horsey, but it's an example. So a husband and wife, and the wife was having a lot of trouble in resenting the husband who was going out and riding his push bike and leaving her with the two children. So she was getting very angry and resentful for him doing that. So when she did get an opportunity to go ride her horses, she was carrying an awful lot of guilt there. And so she was wanting to change her husband's behaviour so he would stay, stay home or let her ride. But then when we talked about the fact that if she was able to let him enjoy the ride and say to him, go, good job, you know, have a, have a ride, really enjoy yourself, it's wonderful that you can do that and genuinely feel as though she was 
able to give him that space and that ride. In turn, by giving him permission to go, she actually gave herself permission to be able to ride her horse herself um, without the guilt. But because she gave him that permission to go and, and enjoy his rides, he then, when he came back, was saying, hey, great, thanks for that. I'll look after the kids. Why don't you go and have a ride? And so, essentially, she wasn't changing his behaviour. She was changing first how she thought about his behaviour, which changed her behaviour, which then by him then also changing his behaviour, but not by her wanting to do that in the beginning. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's all about emotions, isn't it? You've got to think outside the emotions to get what you want. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Well, we wanted to... um, the, The first thing is we want to see... Are we doing, in fact, what we're wanting from our child? So um, if, if you are feeling them getting uh, super emotional, for example, in the warm-up, and you're thinking, well, am I creating that as well? How am I feeling the warm-up? And it can be a little bit of a spiral pattern. So you know, I'll give you another random example. A woman is in pattern behavior. So if a child's been um, angry in the warm-up and takes a snap at the parent, and that becomes a bit of a spiral most time that they're competing, they end up in this argument or the snap. And so if you can change that behaviour in regard to if the child was to, and this sounds a little bit crazy, but you'll understand in a second, if the child snapped the mum, if the mum then did this crazy silly dance or, or had a little a laugh or did something a little bit funny, it actually interrupts the pattern because the child is expecting the, the mum to snap back. But if uh, whoever's there, it doesn't matter, the mum or whatever, if every time she um, danced when the child snapped, two things are happening. Is that it's actually interrupting the pattern that the, the child is used to in the warm-up arena. It's also getting the child to go, oh, my goodness, what's going on? Every time I snap, she dances. So she's, the child's less likely going to want to snap because, oh, my goodness, that's going to embarrass me heaps because there's my mother dancing in the warm-up. So... It's, it brings a little bit of laughter and humour because when you are wanting to interrupt then a pattern, especially for a child, if you can make it a little bit funny and do something crazy when they're expecting you to behave in a different way, it opens the opportunity up. So that parent, for example, and it actually happened and it works really well, um, when the child realised that instead of snapping, mum was going to, to do a dance, they then talked about, well, what is another way or another action that they can do when the child is feeling emotional. So they actually talked about songs that they could, uh, the writer could play, coming into the water, and then feeling that um, in her body, she was feeling herself starting to snap. She could sing a song or she could um, put that sort of music in her mind that helped to change that pattern of what had been playing in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got a point, you know, you've said use choices and questions instead of telling. I suppose that's sort of, you know, listening. Is that what you mean there, you know, using those choices and questions? So if the child snaps, you then um, start dancing, whatever, instead of just saying to the child, don't do it. Yeah, just tell us a little bit more about them. Well, yes, yes. That's more, yeah, that's more interrupting that disempowering pattern. Okay. When we're talking about uh, offering choices and asking questions, it's sort of in case of, I mean, you're right, in case of saying, I need you to do this or please do that, it's saying, well, how, is it, how are you going to feel if you do this? And uh, you can either do this now or you can do it later. But if you do it later, so it might be pack the float or um, you can ride your horse now before dinner or you can ride your horse after dinner. If you ride your horse after dinner, you might not get as much of a ride in. Or so, And you're then handing it back to them to realise that they have their own... Um, they have ownership on those decisions. So... And there'll be a consequence, um, and that's more so of an agreement to saying, well, this is what I need from you, and if you aren't able to do that, this is going to be a consequence that might happen because of it. But if the children are involved in deciding what those consequences are, again, they have ownership in those consequences. So, And often they need to be consequences that you can control. So it might be, um, you know, uh, instead of having to do something, something that you can take away or something that you cannot do for them. So you can actually ensure that that consequence happens. Okay, okay. So the parent learns all these strategies, great. They listen, they go, yep, yep, yep. My child does this, I do this, I can use choices, questions, I don't want to tell them, I'm listening to them. You know, I'm giving those small rewards 
Have you got any strategies for parents to be consistent? <laughs> it's just as holding, I mean, consistently is holding your ground and doing the same thing. And it's just trusting yourself that you're not always going to be their best friend, you're not always going to be in favour when you are being consistent, but that's absolutely okay. So uh, let's say, for example, a um, the phone needs to be put away by 9 o'clock. And initially, when you first say to your young person, okay, the phone needs to be put away at 9 o'clock, there'll be, uh, I still want to be able to finish this game or I need to call this friend or I need to X, Y, Z, and there'll be all sorts of excuses. And, and often there'll be some conflict there. But if every day, no matter what, that phone gets put away at 9 o'clock, after two or three days, your, your child's going to realise that this phone's been taken away by 9 o'clock. There is no ifs or buts about it. So they'll make sure that the phone calls are done beforehand. The kid, the child will then make sure that they finish your game long before nine because they know that at nine o'clock that that, that, that phone so it doesn't take long for they, the children themselves, have ownership about knowing that the phone gets put away. Whereas if you, some days it's 9.45 and some days you take it earlier from them and other days if it gets taken at all, you're going to consistently have that conflict and consistently have that fight. But if it's just this is how it is and for the first few days, you might say, you might not love me for this. You might be frustrated with me for doing this. This is just simply how it's going to be and keep that emotion quite level and not getting worried or upset or anything about it. It's just how it is. Then it won't take long and, and that literally is just how it is. And then you can actually develop that trust relationship there because you actually both know your boundaries. Okay, okay. Now I know that, you know, I mean, I've been out and taught many, many children and had the parents come and say I can't teach this child you teach them I'd rather pay you to teach my child even though I am well qualified to teach them you know is that still the case do we need to find them a good mentor whether it's for writing or for other things yes a mentor is absolutely huge I think every child is a good mentor and we look in generations ago they would always say it took a village to raise a child and I still believe to that day that there's so much more impact that other people around our family can, can have to do with growing our children, growing our yeah, children to good humans. If the thing with when we're a parent and we're also involved with the writing is we have quite an emotional connection with the children and we really don't want to upset them. We don't want to cause any issues that might then cause more problems when we get back home or, or whatnot. So Having a mentor actually has quite a different relationship, especially if it's a mentor that they highly, highly respect. So if it's a could be a coach or it could be somebody that's already competing at the level that they want to be competing, but doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that's in that writing environment. But they're the ones that are able to have lots of conversations. And the difficult ones sometimes call call the kids out on because kids sometimes get caught in loops and they get caught in stories. Oh, it's somebody else's fault or it's um, everyone's picking on me or this always happens to me, they get caught a little bit in those loops. And as parents, if we're not aware, and I do it sometimes myself, is we want to be able to try and go in there and, and fix that. And we want to find out what's happening and do I need to talk to somebody else about it? Whereas a mentor is able to go, oh, don't even worry about that rubbish. Or they, they understand that they're just getting caught up in a little bit of a story and then say, why don't you just do this? And just give them somewhere to go out of that looping pattern and even if it challenges them or if it touches a little bit of a nerve or if it makes them a little bit uncomfortable, because the mental doesn't have an emotional connection with them so much, it doesn't affect them. They're just very present and very there. And they can challenge the kids a little bit more that perhaps we can't as parents. But they also do tend to see things through a different perspective. So they might come at it from a different point of view that perhaps us as parents haven't seen because we tend to behave the way that our parents had taught us and then our children tend to behave the way that we teach us because of this ongoing pattern, whereas a, a mentor might come in from a completely different perspective and offer the, the child something where they just go, oh, wow, I hadn't thought about it like that. So that, that's what they can offer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and I know you talked before, you know, about putting the phone away at nine o'clock. That's it, put it away and being consistent. But just that whole timetable, you know, put the phone away at nine o'clock, but having different other set times. And um, how does that how does that help? Or what can, what strategies have you got to um, 
to help them if it is a good idea? What can parents do to do that, to help that? Uh, you mean in set a timetable for them to work involved in their day? To yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the most important thing is that the, the children need to be congruent and they need to understand the whys behind the timetabling. So if they can... If they know what their long-term goal is and if they've chunked down with you saying uh, each day I need to make sure I, I, I need to go for a five-minute run or I need to um, uh, I need to do some squats because I need to get a little bit stronger, for example. We can actually use get in the habits and use some habit stacking and timetable things that are going to work for us. So this is an adult concept, but it was it's just a bit of an idea is that if we're wanting to do some squats, for example, we know that every day we're going to make a coffee at 9 o'clock. While you're waiting for coffee to come in, to boil, you can be doing your 10 squats. So you're still getting those squats in, but you're rather than having to go and say, oh, I need to go and do your squats at some point through the day and all day it seems to be annoying you that it's not been done, you just know as soon as you can actually to have a coffee, which you know you're going to have every morning, you just do the squats then. And so it's then done and gone. You can move on the next thing. So the, the timetabling with the kids really be quite clever and creative as how can we make the right things easy and the wrong things hard and get quite creative in the timetabling. Table. But we do need to also remember sometimes is that most women just to change your habits initially in the beginning, it may not be, it doesn't happen perfectly every day. So if we have this expectation that, right, if we're going to, if you need to get fitter um, or you're going to ride the horse every single day, if they get to day two or three and then they realise for the next two days, oh, I just don't have time or something else comes up, often they then go, I can't do it, it's too much, and they quit. But if you're able to remind them, hang on, three out of five days, you rode that horse. Great job. Well done. Let's see if we can get another ride in next week. And great, you got six days out of ten. And you can show them that if you stay ticking along, even though you might not get it done every day, you're getting it done more often than not. And it's a muscle, like any anything that we're trying to build and, and time saving itself, but getting into habits is a muscle. It isn't something that we can just go, I'm going to start this. I mean, that's why everybody... Start new um, New Year's resolutions, and then after a week, <laughs> we just completely abandon them because we make them too big, and we just think that this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life. Whereas with little guys, especially, we really do need to try and help them to learn that it's you may not get it right every time, but you're getting it done more often than you're not getting it done. So not really so tough on themselves when it doesn't happen. They're like, "That's okay. I can get back up and I can go again, and I'm just going to keep taking away what I can." Um, the other thing I think if we're going back to, you know, timetabling is really trying to stick to the same thing each time, each same time each day. So I know, for example, you know, my horses, I tend to bring them in at the same time every morning. They all get ridden and they all go out. But if I bring them in in the afternoon because something else comes up in the morning or if there's a pain in my schedule, the horses are unsettled and they, they tend to fight with each other in the yards and they don't go as well and they don't tie up as well. They're not as relaxed because their little timetables aren't settled. So children love certainty. They just love to know, and that comes back with the consistency, of about what time is everything going to be happening because when they're being confident that they're able to know where can they manoeuvre around there and what sort of decisions can they make within that space because they pretty much know how each day is going to go. And it all allows them to handle small little inconsistencies um, or variables and uncertainties better because they know that the rest of it is going to be certain. They know how the rest of the day is going to go. Um, and it gives them a lot more confidence and they tend to be more level and calm. Okay. Okay. I loved before when you said, you know, the child snaps in the ring so the mother does a dance. There's sort of patterns of behaviour and just interrupting those, anything that depowers with a bit of humour. Have you got just some strategies to recognise so the parents can recognise what's going to be disempowering, what's positive behaviour? Tell us a little bit more about in that line. Yeah, sure. So they we do tend to think of um, anger, for example, as being a negative negative emotion, but it actually isn't necessarily negative. There's a whole lot of times where anger can be a positive thing. It's where we hold our boundaries. It's when we say enough is enough, no more, those sorts of things. You know, when anger is into violence and we start to see 
a rider, for example, and, and we do see it sometimes, but the kids get frustrated and the first thing they want to do is, you know, spin the neck around or hit the horse or pull on the reins and those sorts of things. And it's where the children move from that feeling of, of emotion into being angry. And so helping them feel in their body to start with really early on, what do I feel before what happens happens? And so sometimes it's actually about having those conversations. Where else do you feel yourself getting um, anxious? Where else do you start to be in an exam? So often kids that get quite anxious in the warm-up, they put a lot of pressure and expectation on themselves to do well, but they might also find that they do the same thing in the classroom. They might find that they do the same thing when they're meeting someone new in a new environment. And so having, having chats with them, what do you feel first? Do you feel your stomach gets a little bit of a knot or do you feel a knot at the end of your throat or do you feel yourself start to hold a little bit tight and then you can discuss, well, what goes on in your mind then? You know, what are you thinking about when that happens? And then helping them find some um, interruptions then. So you can you can put a little um, a quote or something that they might say during that time or you can even tell them a funny joke. So I often... If I find it, and I used to do this a little bit with the students at NEGS, if they were getting themselves rolled up and um, uncertain and unconfident and they were just getting themselves caught in a loop, I would tell them a random joke or I would um, say, can you imagine like a pink octopus riding across in front of that girl's horse right there? How funny <laughs> would that look? And it just wraps that. And it's only a small thing. It can be... It can be anything random, but preferably something that is funny and it's something, something you do, a joke that you have, uh, something that happened, you can even link back to something funny that happened the day or the prior or the years before or wherever, and it just immediately changes the state of the writers and the stick and they change the state, you can then link that to something positive. Oh, how good is that going to feel? Oh, do you remember that time that you jumped that the clear around? How good did you feel about that? And you can then link to... How did it feel in your body when you when you felt really good, when you were just free and comfortable and you felt like you didn't have so many pressures on you and they could feel that and they actually go into that state before they enter the arena. So asking questions there is a really good way of putting kids into emotional states that they need to be in. But humour is so um, underused, I think, with little kids. Uh we really do need to quite keep things quite light and quite funny. Yes, we want them to do as well as they can, and um, but that isn't necessarily results driven. You know, they we just and we need to actually let our parents, let our children know sometimes that for us as parents, and, and I'm a parent of three teenage kids, and, and I certainly don't have it right. I'm no, um, they're not really hugely into writing, but the idea is I just want them to have a lot of fun, and so they're out there really enjoying what they're doing and, and I don't expect them to do particularly well, but if they're having fun and they're enjoying it, they're always going to do better anyway. So having those conversations with my kids saying, I just love watching you do this I love watching when you come back and you've had a great ride and you've got this smile on your face. I love it when you've made a connection and you've learned something and you've progressed to where you were and you've felt challenge and pride and letting them know that you see that characteristic in them is a really good thing. Mm, mm, mm. I'm just thinking about kids and, and my experience, you know, going out to a few clubs and teaching the clubs. And I've got to tell you, the, the whole environment at the club is different. You get a club where the parents are out there volunteering, helping you, and they're all sort of having fun. And oh, I've got this jump, I'm going to put up any rails that come off either. And I've got this jump, as opposed to another club that the parents might all be sitting back very critical of things, not out there volunteering and helping and everything, that must have an impact on the club, you know, the fact that the parents volunteer. Has it? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really, really important to pay attention to the, um, well, I'll sort of take a little step back for a minute before I jump into there, is that the language that our children have when they're talking about other people so and other writers we're always wanting to be aware of their external language because it tells us a lot about the internal dialogue. So when we talk about the class that are perhaps quite negative and you, you hear some of the writers and you know, sometimes it does happen, some of the parents that are quite negative, we've all done been there at some stage. Um, but we do tend to find those kids especially that are, oh, she should have done that with that horse or, oh, she's ruining that horse that was a really good one or... 
um, she didn't do as well as she could have or whatnot. Whatever she says, children are saying externally tend to be the internal dialogue that they're saying themselves. So as parents and as coaches and everyone in the club, we really need to be cultivating an environment that's saying, but she's out there having a rip go. And remember last week she had all sorts of trouble with that ox. So look, she's just dumped that ox for she started to come along with that horse. They've only been together for a short, short time. And by saying that aloud to others, you're actually in turn giving permission to your riders or your child to feel the same way about themselves. And so I am only just, and I've had this horse for a short time and I'm just starting to get him going. Or, gee, I have come a long way from two weeks ago. And that really does help the kids to feel as though they themselves are okay with not always having it right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. <laughs> so then the, yes. you're sort of then talking about the volunteering or the being. Mm. Um, the other thing about that is that when we volunteer as as parents, what it's saying to the kids is, I also enjoy your sport and I want to be a part of your sport. Not It's not all about you as a child. You don't tell, you're telling your child you don't have to do well to make me feel significant in the sport or to make me feel important in the sport. I am going to find my own way where I enjoy the sport with you and we can do it together. So I'm going to help pick up some rails. I'll jump in the and I'll learn from my kids. I'll go and what can I do to help your sport? Because this is really important to me and really enjoy that, which is saying to the child, essentially, you're really important to me and I really enjoy your company. And then the child feels as though they can fully embrace the sport and learn and progress own way because they don't need to make us as parents feel better. The parents themselves are having a great time in their sport and enjoying themselves and it just takes way fresh off the kids but it also makes it so much more enjoyable for us when we are in that culture where we are supporting each other and we keep verbalising the effort that people are putting in, that they're grateful for what everybody is doing and again that allows the children to use that language what am I grateful for? I'm grateful for the volunteers I'm grateful for the effort that other people put in for me and the effort that I'm putting in for other people. How am I helping somebody else? And it, it all is that culture. Yeah. Um, we do, don't want the children to feel as though they need to fill our needs, they need to fill our buckets. Um, what can we do together so we can enjoy ourselves together? Yeah, yeah. Just going back to the parents and the parents blaming kids and, and being critical of them, I suppose it just serves no one. You've really got to own your own actions. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I hear this a bit, um, uh, I actually work a little bit with some troubled youth as well that are sort of having a lot of difficulties and they might hear, um, you did a bad thing and they'll see it as I'm a bad person. Whereas we want them to understand, um, they, they may have made a bad choice at that time, but you're still a great person. And the kids then do take almost a little bit too literally if, if you're just saying, you might want to be saying that wasn't the best choice that you made and making sure they really understand you, you're still an amazing person and, hey, look, here's some other opportunities that in the future we might make some different choices. What did you learn from this? Like, why did we realise this probably wasn't the best choice? What happened as a result of that? Okay, do we want that result? No, cool. What can we do the next time? So you're working together and helping your children to come up with some different solutions. So you're not telling them, next time you should have done this or you should have done that. You're able to say, why is that? Why do you think that that wasn't the best choice? What what didn't work out so well? You know, and then you can say, well, what could we do? What would we do? You could brainstorm, even though you might know the answer as a parent or a coach. You might be going, no, in fact, what needs to be done differently the next time. But by asking them the questions and letting them back their brains, well, what could have I done? What 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 I do next time? What what options have I got? And it keeps reminding them you have options. There's always options. There's always different ways to respond. And that goes back to that feeling. Uh, you might feel a specific emotion. You might be feeling angry. You might be feeling frustrated or you might be feeling tired. But you can choose to act differently. So I'm feeling frustrated and I just want to scream. I'm totally cool with feeling this in my body, but I'm going to respond differently. I'm going to respond calmly or I'm going to respond with some, um, with some purpose, but I'm going to let that frustration turn into violence and really changing that between what am I feeling, but I can choose differently to act. Okay. Annika, I think as a parent, it would be great for people to call up, you know, to contact you if they've got questions about their kids. You know, they might sort of on the surface, even if they're local, bring their child to you for a lesson, but 
talk to you about developing this relationship because I think it's a really important one, you know, and I think it's a really important one for the riders, for the child to develop as a rider, but also for the parent to be able to support the child to develop as a rider. So if people would like to contact you, what's the best way? Yeah, sure. So my mobile number will be there on the website. They can just uh, email me or call me. Mm -hmm. But I do actually get quite a lot of parents that we do work together where because there is no right or wrong and every relationship is completely different and every need and child is completely different, when I'll have conversations with parents, it's more of a case of brainstorming ideas. There's no, I, I'm no guru. I'm only learned through experiences. I've done a lot of interviewing of high performance writers and, and asked them, what was your environment like as when you were a child? What were your parents like? And I've, I've learned through research that way past the years of looking at nags and different students and different parents. And then looking at the opposite end of the spectrum of working with these children at Backtrack that have had trauma and, and incredibly difficult lives with their parents and seeing how that impacts the the child's well being and, and self self worth and so forth. So whenever I work with parents it isn't a case of this is right or this is wrong. It's where are you at, what are some ideas, what's happening, how can because it's so personal. Every little uh, thing we'll try is very relative and personal to each individual family. So um, yeah, very welcoming for anybody that would love to throw some ideas around for sure. Yeah, yeah. And those details, of course, are going to be on um, horsechats.com and just in the search, you can search for Annika, which is A-N-N-Y-K-A, or search for Overton. And I would say go back, listen to Annika's previous chats. She studied in the Human Brain Development Institute so she certainly, you know, she's she knows what she's doing as a coach, but she also knows what she's doing developing the relationship between parents and young riders. So I would urge you, any um, questions you've got in those areas, to contact Annika and uh, see how you go with that. Annika, thank you again for your time. Really appreciate you coming on. It's always good talking to you. <laughs> and I love talking with you too, Gwyneth. Thank you. Thank you. Look, hopefully we'll catch up sometime soon. And, um, yeah, I'm sure you'll have something else that you can chat to us about that is going to be as insightful and interesting as what was today. It was good. <laughs> Absolutely, no <Yeah>. doubt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much, Anne Annika. All right. Cheers. See you. Bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.